So uh, today is Saturday, March 28th, 2015, and we will resume uh, with uh, the Vimalakirti Sutra. Uh, we are using the uh, Burton Watson translation from Kumarajiva's translation from Sanskrit to Chinese. The sutra was probably composed about 100 AD. Uh, Kumarajiva's translation is uh, maybe around 500. AD. Uh, <coughs> the sutra, if you remember, is about the uh, very involved in life, uh, wealthy layman, uh, Vimalakirti, whose name means spotless reputation, uh, and uh, he is a contemporary of the Buddha Shakyamuni and noted for great uh, wisdom and skillful means. So much so that uh, first the disciples and then the bodhisattvas themselves are hesitant to go and engage him in a Dharma conversation. They all give their reasons, uh, which basically come down to uh, Vimalakirti uh, seemed to be completely uh, able to uh, outrun them and uh, get right past them in terms of any Dharma discussion or activities, uh, presentations that arose between them. And so they're a bit shy. Uh, finally, Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom himself, uh, coerced uh, by Shakyamuni Buddha, agrees to go see the old layman Vimalakirti. Uh, now, <clears throat> Manjushri, uh, seems to have the same difficulties as everyone else, but he basically shrugs and goes, well, if you ask me to do it, uh, Shakyamuni, uh, I'll do it. And so uh, with his gumption in place, he heads off for his encounter with the layman, Vimalakirti, and many beings, uh, disciples, bodhisattvas, uh, uh, gods, uh, all kinds of people, laymen, laywomen, go, wow, this is going to be an interesting exchange. Uh, I want to go see what happens. So there's a huge crowd that's gone with Manjushri. Now, Vimalakirti, if you remember, uh, has taken illness as a skillful means. Uh, and when they first come, uh, he and Vimalakirti get into quite a discussion about the nature of our illness. Because, of course, we're all ill. Bodhisattvas are ill with the great illness of compassion itself, uh, wanting so much to help, uh, still being bound uh, by that great desire to be of use, to be of help. It's the sickness of bodhisattvas. And of course, all beings uh, are ill with the fundamental illness of me in here, uh, you out there, uh, me separate and alone in a world I never the moon, stars, wind, rain, snow, bugs, trash, uh, surround us, uh, seemingly uh, outside us all the time. And the anguish that this causes is the very sickness uh, that then addresses. What's again so interesting about the sutra is that long before there was uh, Zen Buddhism as we know it, uh, the Vimalakirti Sutra, uh, gave us the world of Zen. Uh, it said you didn't have to be a monk. You didn't have to be a nun. In fact, it pokes fun at the whole institution, the whole hierarchy. It says your original nature is here all the time. And if you can wake to it, well, you could even be a, a sick old layman with money, and lots of involvement in life, and my gosh, uh, you might have more uh, Dharma accessibility and functioning than the guys who've got those shaved heads and are uh, sitting quietly under the trees in their semi or very monastic settings. Uh, it's an interesting challenge that the Vimalakirti Sutra presents us, even today, uh, how to live fully, uh, embody the Dharma, embody the way as each of us only can. We're each unique, there'll never be another who we are, here's our opportunity uh, to exactly uh, find the way and uh, present it to our suffering world, to be it, 
and you'll suffer a crazy war. Uh, as you go out of the Zendo, if you look to the wall by the cushion mat, you'll see Hakuin's portrait of Vimala Kurdi, a wily old layman. So it's by the cushions. On the way out, if you look, it's Vimala Kurdi himself uh, pinned up on the wall. So we're now looking at chapter seven regarding living beings. Uh, and this continues the dialogue between Mandrushri and Vimala Kurdi. At that time, Mandrushri asked Vimala Kurdi, how does the bodhisattva regard living beings? And what Vimala Kurdi says is so interesting because what he's basically doing is expounding the Diamond Sutra. Uh, and he says, as a conjurer looks on the beings, he conjures up. Thus does the bodhisattva regard living beings. As the wise view the moon in the water, or a face or form seen in a mirror, a shimmers of heat in a torrid season, like the heat waves rising off asphalt as they drive down the highway in the middle of summer. I remember being a kid and being so fascinated by seeing uh, the mirages that heat would create. That's how you should regard all beings, says Vimala Kurdi, as the echo that follows a cry, as clouds in the sky, as foam on the water, bubbles on the water, as a thing no firmer than the trunk of the plantain, no longer lasting than a flash of lightning, as a fifth great element, there's only four, you know, a sixth component, a seventh sense media, a thirteenth sense media, a nineteenth sense realm, the eighteenth, thus does the bodhisattva regard living beings, that is, as an idea of things that isn't quite so, what if our very uh, sense of the world around us isn't quite so? As you know, enlightenment is really another word for intimacy. We don't get enlightenment. We simply realize a fundamental intimacy that's always there uh, between us and all beings. Not quite so, the world we tend to live in. As forms in the world of formlessness, as sprouts from charred grain. That's impossible, isn't it? You can't get sprouts from charred grain. As mistaken views of the body in one who has entered the stream that leads to the state of arhat. Entering the stream means the inevitable flow towards Buddhahood. Taking up a path of practices. Entering the stream passing various milestones in your practice. It's entering the stream. It's flowing in a direction. What is that direction? Where does it lead? Uh, as a re-entering of the womb by one no longer subject to rebirth, as the three poisons of greed, anger, and ignorance in an arhat. It's impossible. Arhat, very enlightened, very found being, no longer driven by the habitual conditioned poisons of greed, hatred, and ignorance. And yet, Vimala Kurdi says, that's how you should see your, a living being as the three poisons in an arhat, as greed, anger, or breaking of the precepts on the part, or violation of the precepts on the part of a bodhisattva who has accepted the birthless nature of all existence birthless nature of all existence, Vajna, Paramita, Vidaya, no birth, no death, no end to them, uh, the very ground that we hear from, that we sit from, that we speak from, that we pick our noses from, birthless nature. a bodhisattva who's really seen this violate the precepts. As vestiges of earthly desire in a Buddha. Of course, this raises uh, an issue about um, events in the Sanghas, uh, uh, which uh, Buddhist community 
not just Zen, but Zen too, deals with all the time. Uh, vestiges of earthly desire in a Buddha. Well, I mentioned to you an interesting discussion through the AZ American Zen Teachers Association, uh, told to me by a, a Dharma friend who's a Zen teacher. He said people were going back and forth, back and forth about, well, yeah, uh, this teacher or that teacher uh, uh, is so deeply realized, and yet uh, uh, they just have this uh, heavy karma. Uh, they've uh, done these things that have hurt other people. And uh, finally, a senior Zen teacher, uh, someone I respect very much, uh, <coughs> uh, chimed in. This was all an email conversation. Chimed in and said, well, let's face it. Uh, I'm sure they have realization. Uh, but why do we think it has to be overwhelmingly deep realization? Uh, if they did have really deep realization, they wouldn't do such things. As Vimala Kirti says, uh, uh, as vestiges of earthly desire in a full Buddha, as forms seen by a blind person, another impossibility, as the breathing in and out of one immersed in the samadhi of utter tranquility, Samadhi of utter tranquility. Even the breath falls away. As the tracks of a bird in the sky. As a child born to a barren woman. As earthly desires in a phantom being. As sights in a dream after one has wakened. As the taking on of bodily form by one who has entered extinction, as fire that has no smoke. Thus does the bodhisattva regard living beings. In other words, it's not quite what we think. It's not quite what we take for granted. In fact, our normal view is really seen from that absolute ground of our nature, kind of impossible. Manjushri said, if the bodhisattva looks on beings in this way, how can he treat them with compassion? Now that's an excellent question. Remember, bodhisattva Manjushri is the bodhisattva of wisdom. And he's so wise and so skilled, he's taken a very humble role in the Vimalakirti Sutra, acting as if he doesn't know and so he gives Vimalakirti all the stage he needs to present uh, his teaching on the Dharma. Very integrated teaching because he's a layman out in the world. So the great wisdom of Manjushri here reveals itself in what he doesn't take, what he doesn't shine as, what he doesn't uh, push himself forward in. It's a tremendous humility, uh, the great wisdom uh, of Manjushri, the Bodhisattva great skillfulness. It's really a wonderful thing to see. And he asks a very good question. If the bodhisattva looks on beings in this way, that is, as dreams, as phantoms, uh, how can he treat them with compassion? I mean, then you might just go, well, it's, it's your karma to suffer. Uh, none of my business. You're just a dream anyway. It could lead to a very cold-hearted, very uh, narrow-minded, very uh, harsh understanding. So Mantrashi rightly uh, raises this question. Then Vimala Kirti says, uh, when the Bodhisattva has finished regarding them in this way, he thinks to himself, for the sake of living beings, I must preach the Dharma to them. This is true compassion. That is, uh, compassion takes precedence, always. A sense of somewhat off sense of our ordinary reality, the illusory nature of it, does not give us any grounds to act without compassion. Emptiness is form. Form emptiness. We can't take refuge in emptiness in the midst of 
all the complex and painful things of the world. And this is part of the vow of the Bodhisattva. He treats them, says Vimalakirti, with a compassion of tranquil extinction. Put this in the ground, something one almost might say isn't born, for it results in no birth. He treats them with a compassion unburning, for it is void of earthly, that is self centered desires. The Bodhisattva acts with love, but not a self centered love, not earthly desire, uh, treats them with a compassion that is impartial. It is, it's a great love because it's selfless. So everything enters and wipes the Bodhisattva away. And everything takes its place. It's just what it is. Partial loves. Selfless presence confirmed. As Dogen says, when we step confirmed by the 10,000 things, as Dogen says, when we push the self forward to become one with the 10,000 things, it's called delusion. When we allow 10,000 things to step in and wipe us away, become us, it's called intimacy or realization or enlightenment. As the three existences of past, present, and future are impartial, treats them, oh, I'm sorry, treats them with a compassion that is impartial as the three existences of past, present, and future are impartial, treats them with a compassion free of contention, for nothing arises to oppose it, treats them with a compassion undualistic, for internal and external have no place in it. Is that a stone in your mind? Zen teacher once asked a very advanced monk, yes, it is, he said, it's in my mind, it's not outside me. Oh, was the response, it must be awfully heavy to walk around with that boulder in your mind. Oh, the monk then realized he needed to stay with that teacher a bit longer uh, and sort that out. Uh, internal and external have no place in it treats them with a compassion unfaltering, for it carries through to the end. What is the end? The end of me, the end of you, the end of inside, the end of outside. It's a lovely story of Nelson Foster Roshi, Aiken Roshi's Dharma heir, uh, who leads, has led for many years what are called mountains and rivers, Sashin, into very wilderness areas, uh, very rugged where they walk or hike all day. Once they see kayak, now, anyway, they walk and hike all day, and then in the evening set up tents and camp, uh, cook meal, do zazen, have dope, so go on and on in this way. Well, once they were doing this along the shore, coast of Northern California, and uh, they're walking along in single file doing kinhin and on this kind of deserted coast. And they pass a guy who's camped there. And he's sitting there with his backpack and such. And maybe he's just cooked a meal over a fire. And uh, he sees this line of weirdos uh, marching by with their heads screwed on straight, you know, spines upright, hands in kinhin posture, and packs on their backs. And he calls out, hey, how far are you going? Nelson, uh, without batting an eye, uh, calls back, all the way. Hey, says the guy, wait for me. And he joined the Keenheen line and was, has been practicing with them ever since. Uh, all the way, for it carries through to the end. All the way. It doesn't have to mean in time. I mean, right now, in this moment, all the way. Treats them with a compassion firm and durable, for the mind of the Bodhisattva never flags. Treats them with a compassion clean and pure, as the nature of all phenomena is pure. Treats them with a compassion boundless. Boundless, as Vimalakirti, as the empty sky. There is no limit. 
No limit. No limit at all. This is our nature. And out of this boundless nature, compassion arises if we let it. He treats them with the compassion of the arhat, who has conquered the thieves of desire, treats them with the compassion of the bodhisattva, who brings contentment to all beings, treats them with the compassion of the thus come one, the dagata, the Buddha, thus come one, carries no traces of where he's come from, no traces of where he's going to, completely present. Thus come one, who has grasped the marks of suchness, treats them with the compassion of the Buddha, who awakens living beings, treats them with the compassion wholly natural, understanding that it is causeless. It's not logically derived. It arises out of the depths of our own nature, which is not past, present, or future. The teachings tell us. Treats them with the compassion of Bodhi, which is of one flavor only. One flavor only. Just this. One taste only. Just this. The Lotus Sutra says, so there are various yanas, various ways. Mahayana means great way, various ways, suited to people's uh, various aspirations and tendencies. So there are deer carts and goat carts, and finally there are ox carts for those who want to be on the great way, because the ox cart can carry the most people. Uh, but then the Buddha reveals in the Lotus Sutra in reality, uh, there's only one cart. The deer carts and the goat carts, the smaller vehicles, uh, just skillful means everyone's already on the great way, the great way of wisdom and compassion, uh, boundless awareness, boundless love. Uh, this is our nature, the maha, great, yana. Uh, so. Treats them with the compassion of Bodhi, which is of one flavor only. That flavor is the flavor of the vow of the Bodhisattva to liberate all beings, because it's our nature uh, to do so. Treats them uh, with a compassion that has no gradation. It's not, oh, I'll be more compassionate to this person, more compassion. No. That's, of course, difficult to do, but. That's what practice ultimately is about. Uh, compassion to a piece of trash on the sidewalk. No separation uh, from the crow picking at a dead squirrel on the ground that's been squashed. Uh, no separation from the person who says mean things to us or about us. No separation from the person who treats us with love. No gradation, very difficult to do, but there it is. For it cuts off all favoritism. <coughs> Treats them with great pity and compassion, guiding them, <coughs> excuse me, with the great vehicle. <coughs> As the Lotus Sutra says, there's only the great vehicle. Other vehicles are there to help us get a leg up get on board, but uh, once we've started riding, begin to realize that all there is is the great vehicle and the great vow to realize our own nature and be a benefit to all beings. He treats them with a compassion that never despairs, uh, seeing that all is empty and without ego. Very important words for our time. Uh, read the newspaper, it's hard to read. Uh, open the internet, it's hard to take a look at it without some degree of despair, very hard. And yet, Vimalakirti lays it out. He treats them with a compassion that never despairs, seeing that all is empty and without ego. So see from the base of reality, which does not mean ignoring the pain. That would already be not seeing from the base empty mind. Treats them with the compassion of bestowal of the Dharma, 
never stinting in its gifts, treats them with the compassion of observance of the precepts, training those who break them to do better, not judge them, help them do better, treats them with the compassion of forbearance, guarding both others and self very hard. Very hard, the paramitas, as you know, the perfections. Uh, one of the perfections is forbearance, holding back, not taking revenge when we can, not giving in to desire when we can, uh, not doing what we might, but forbearing. Why? It's not a matter of preventing oneself from doing something you'd like. Uh, seeing clearly the whole situation and forbearing to do things that simply are self-centered. That's it. Guarding both others and self treats them with the compassion of assiduousness. That is, virya, one another, one of the paramitas, vigor. Uh, Jack Kerouac translated vigor, virya, as enthusiasm. That is practicing enthusiastically. Why not? <laughs> Why not practice enthusiastically after all? It's kind of a joyous thing. And as the uh, uh, little chant on opening the Dharma says, it's been very hard for each of us to come in touch with the Dharma. It's true, there's lots of talk about Buddhism these days. Uh, it's in the air. But to come in touch with a place, uh, a way to actually practice, uh, it's said to be like a blind turtle uh, in a vast ocean. Every hundred years, the blind turtle sticks its head up out of the sea. And floating on that ocean is a board with a hole in it. What are the odds that the turtle, once every hundred years, sticking its head up, blind turtle, will stick its head right through the hole in the board? Long odds, he says. The uh, uh, parable in one of the sutras told by the Buddha says, that's the odds that you face already. In coming to... Uh, the activity of a, a practice um, and uh, making it your own. Uh, one, uh, actually, it's it's actually a parable of how difficult it is to be born as a human being, first of all. Uh, but then the parable goes further and says, so that's how hard it is to have been born as a human being, where you have an opportunity to practice the Dharma. And then it goes to say, and it's even harder, once you're a human being, to come in touch with a practice. I don't, it doesn't matter if it's Buddhist, Sufi, Christian, Jewish, whatever it is, a, a genuine practice that helps you to drop self-centeredness, to have that narrative that's at the center of our mind, at the very least, not be center stage and let the world in and react to one's real nature, which is the world, one's real body. That is very, very rare. Uh, treats them, so that's why enthusiasm, uh, assiduousness, seems like a good response. Let's be enthusiastic uh, about the, uh, yes, it's a difficult path, but my gosh, uh, let's be enthusiastic. It's a wonderful thing. Shouldering all beings as its burden treats them with the compassion of meditation, unaffected by taste, treats them with the compassion of wisdom. These are the paramitas. Generosity, assiduousness, morality, meditation, uh, these are all the paramitas. Uh, treats them with the compassion of wisdom, which always knows the right time. That is skillfulness, upaya. Uh, you can't just say to somebody you meet on the street, hey, you're a Buddha, wake up. I mean, you can, but you'll get locked up pretty soon. Uh, you'll get punched. Or, uh, in other words, it's always in terms of the place, the time, the person, skillfulness. He's talking about the paramitas. Uh, treats them with the compassion of expedient means. Again, that's upaya, skillful means. With manifestations suited to every occasion. It's a time and place uh, to speak about the Dharma. Dharma, there's a time and place to get up and dance at a party. Uh, there's a time and place to have a little sip of wine. Uh, there's a time and place show it, not talk about it at all. Uh, Pema Likurti is saying that is a manifestation of compassion for all beings. 
That's how you treat others with compassion. He treats them with a compassion that hides nothing, proceeding with a, the purity of an upright mind, treats them with the compassion of a deeply searching mind. As we know, in the koan practice, let's say, we can say there are different degrees. There's the cat and uh, a hen with an egg practice, keeping it warm. Doesn't matter if you're questioning or not. Uh, it's like a hen keeping its egg warm in complete faith that that egg is going to hatch if it's just kept warm. And then there's cat at the mouse hole practice, where we're so alert. It's like a cat at a mouse hole. Slightest movement will reveal the mouse completely. So we're completely present, like a cat crouched at a mouse hole. And then there's a, like boiling water practice, which we can get to in a couple of days of session, where there's no cat, no mouse, no hen, no egg. There's nothing but just moo, moo. What is it? Moo, moo, or whatever the koan point is, or even breath. no one doing it. Complete combustion. So, Vimala Kirti says, treats them with the compassion of a deeply searching mind. Give yourself completely to it is how one enters the vow of the Bodhisattva for real. Because with a deeply searching mind, we have to get out of the way. A tepidly searching mind. You know, we're a lot there. With a deeply searching mind, there's nothing but the searching. We're off center stage. Hooray! Hooray! What a liberation! That is. You don't have to expect some separate realization on top of that. He treats them with a deeply searching mind. The compassion, Vimala Kurti says. He, get, get this. He says, treats them with the compassion of a deeply searching mind. Because when we search deeply, we're out of the way, and compassion can naturally be there. Where did you think it was hiding? A deeply searching mind, one free of irrelevant motion, that is, of irrelevant thoughts. Oh, I've got to pay the bills, irrelevant motion. Oh, wow, my knee, it's bothering me. I guess I should go to the doctor, irrelevant motion. In that moment. It's just deeply searching mind. And then because of that, there is real compassion, no separation. Treats them with a compassion that is unerring, innocent of falsity and sham. Treats them with a compassion full of peace and delight. Well, that's why we're enthusiastic, because we experience peace and delight, delight. Very encouraging sign of delight in our practice. For through it they gain the delight of the Buddha. The Buddha uh, was in anguish as a young man when he saw the difficulties of our world, the impermanence, the sickness, the dying. Uh, it bothered him deeply. What he found in his practice was delight. In fact, he was so delightful after his long night of facing all the challenges of Mara, he sat there under the tree for three weeks, so filled with delight. He had no thought of getting up, or if he did, it seemed irrelevant. Who would there be, after all, to teach anything to? How silly. Impossible. Uh, and yet, when he did get up to teach exactly uh, what one could, if one lifted it, experience, uh, as he did. For though through it they gain the delight of the Buddha, such is the compassion of the Bodhisattva. What could be more wonderful than to know that? Continuing this questioning, Mandrashi asked, what do you mean when you speak of pity? I mean, said Vimala Kurti, that whatever benefits the Bodhisattva gain, whatever benefits the Bodhisattva gains, he shares them. <coughs> 
all, with all other living beings, replied Vimalakirti. <coughs> Mandrusri said, what do you mean by joy? Vimalakirti said, any way the Bodhisattva can aid or enrich others, he views as an occasion for joy, never for regret. Mandrusri said, what do you mean by indifference? Uh, you might say equanimity, equanimity or non-attachment. Vimalakirti said, whatever the blessings or good fortune the Bodhisattva bestows, he expects nothing in return. If you remember, the Emperor Wu from Bodhidharma came from India to China, asked, what merit uh, have I gained uh, from building temples, uh, translating uh, and copying sutras, uh, making uh, donations to charities, and uh, creating almshouses for the poor? etc., etc., and uh, Bodhidharma replied, uh, no merit whatsoever. The Bodhisattva he expects nothing in return. Why does he expect nothing in return? Not because he's a good boy scout or she's a good girl scout. Because there's no one the merit can return to. Bodhidharma opened the gate of Zen. The Emperor Wu didn't quite get it. Later on, he regretted it. That's the nature of life. Manjushri uh, asked, uh, if the Bodhisattva fears the cycle of birth and death, what should he rely on? And let's face it, who doesn't fear the cycle of birth and death, at least for most of their life? <laughs> Maybe at some point we have moments where we don't fear the cycle of birth and death. So Mandrashi asks a very pertinent question, since birth and death uh, is the nature of our life, and it's often attended by a certain degree of fear. Maybe we can be all right now, but uh, what happens when we're on our deathbed? What do we do then? If the Bodhisattva fears the cycle of birth and death, what should he or she rely on? asked Mandrashri. And Vimalakirti says, the Bodhisattva fearing the cycle of birth and death should rely on the power of the Tathagata's blessings. Mandrashri said, if he hopes to rely on the power of the Tathagata's blessings, what course should he pursue? Vimalakirti said, if he hopes to rely on the power of the Tathagata's blessings, he should devote himself to saving and liberating all living beings. <coughs> that is, we help ourselves and our own, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> terror, <coughs> our own terror of birth and death by dropping our self-centeredness and being of use to others. But again, it's not about being a good boy scout or a good girl scout. And doing it to get a merit badge, uh, oh, now I can be less afraid of the cycle of birth and death uh, if I go out and help others. Uh, no. You won't find that very effective. That too will get taken from you. In the end, uh, but by saving, how do you save others anyway? By saving and liberating all living beings. That's quite a challenge, wouldn't you say? Uh, we vow. First of our Bodhi, Bodhisattva vows every, at the end of every formal round of Zazen, uh, period of Zazen. Uh, many beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Uh, seems like a very egotistic vow. Uh, I'm going to save them, huh? Uh, how would you do that? Well, the second vow gives us a little bit of insight into that. Uh, greed, hatred, and ignorance rise endlessly. I vow to abandon them. That is, we can save beings by being aware of our own greed, our own anger, our own 
ignorance. Because if we're not, we're going to put them on all the living beings around us, the people we love. They'll have to bear the burden of our greed, our ignorance, our anger. And so we can begin to save all beings by taking responsibility for what we for what we ourselves put out there and put on others. If we own it, oh, we don't spread it around. It makes the burden of others and our world a bit lighter. And of course, then the next, uh, Dharma gates are countless. I vow to wake to them, to not stint in continuing on. This very difficult moment, whatever it is, maybe a Dharma opportunity, we can say, don't step back from it. Don't hide out from it. Go right with it. Breathe into it. Be it completely. Same with koans. This one, completely. It's not about the numbers. Who cares what number it is? Each one can resolve our terror of birth and death. We do it completely, going all the way, as Vanilla Curtain says. So he should devote himself to saving and liberating all living beings. Mantrasri says, if he hopes to save living beings, what must he do? We'll stop here, recite the four vows together with all beings. <laughs> <laughs>